Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. So in 1874, a fellow named Henry Woodward and his friend Matthew Evans created an invention that was absolutely remarkable for its time. They took a glass tube, put in a piece of carbon, fixed a wire to each end of the piece of carbon, filled the tube with an inert gas and sealed it, and then hooked it up to an electrical generator and the piece of carbon inside glowed. And the light bulb was invented. And you've probably never heard of Woodward and Evans as the inventors of the light bulb, have you? You thought that was Thomas Edison. It wasn't Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison bought the patent from them and improved the design and made it last much longer Thomas Edison gets credit for an invention he did not invent. Actually, he gets credit for a lot of inventions that he did not invent. But he was, a, he was an improver of products. He did, invent, he did come up with the electrical grid that we're familiar with. The, the invention of the light bulb has literally revolutionized the world. The world is a remarkably different place than it was 100 years ago because we have electric lights and electric heat. We have electric hot water heaters and we take it for granted. You can turn the thing on in your house and have a hot bath like that. You can flip the switch and it's bright and you can see all night if you want. We take it for granted now. Think about how different the world was 130 years ago without electric lights. Most folks' lives were governed by the rising and the setting of the sun. Sun went down, you couldn't see anyway, so go to bed. And we got plenty of sleep back then. We don't now, because we've got to stay up till midnight, because we have lights and we can see what we're doing in our insomnia. Prior to this modern invention, if you wanted to see at nighttime, it was a candle or an oil lamp or a torch or a fire. Basically, an open flame ruled the world. Folks didn't go out at night because you couldn't see what you were doing. And the only folks that went out at night, well, you knew they were up to mischief anyway, right? Because in the dark and nobody can see you, that's the perfect time to cause trouble. Nobody's going to catch you. They won't know where you went. So the cover of darkness was where all the bad sort of things happened. All through Scripture, the illustration of light and dark are used to describe good and evil. When the scriptures talk about light, they're talking about love and truth and the will of God and the blessing of God and the purity of God, living and doing what is right in God's sight. When the scriptures talk about dark and darkness, they're talking about wickedness, evil, sin, uh, lack of understanding, the unwillingness to know and do God's will. Isaiah chapter 60 is a good example to start with. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, a deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen on you. The Gentiles will come to your, what? Your light? Kings to the brightness of your rising. We understand that instinctively. We know exactly what that's talking about. The goodness of God is going to come upon us. We know that it's a prophecy of the Messiah that is to come. We know that the light is the truth and the glory of God. We know that the darkness is the wickedness of mankind. We get it. Don't have to think twice about it. Because the light and the dark, they are real things. They are truths, and they convey this deep and profound spiritual reality. In Ezekiel 1, the prophet had a vision of the throne of God, and the words that stand out speak of 
brilliant and bright burning fire, crystals, a rainbow with a brilliance and a glow about it, and there's all this brightness that talks about in the presence of God. And when he saw it, he had to fall down on his face because it was so very overwhelming. Light and dark. In the wisdom of Solomon, Proverbs chapter 4, the way of the wickedness is what? Darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. The wise man's eyes are in his head. The fool walks in darkness. Time and time again, the light tells us what is right and holy and good. And we see the darkness describing that which is sinful against God and against his principles and his truth. Satan himself is called the prince of darkness. John chapter 1, the illustration, this whole theme continues. In him, in that word which was with God and was God, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. Darkness does not comprehend. So in that context, with all these themes and illustrations in the forefront of our minds, we come to our focal text, the second of Jesus' powerful I am statements. Would you stand, please, that we honor the reading of the word, John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Father God, we thank you for the light that is shining in our lives, and we pray, God, that it would shine forth from our lives. We thank you for your beloved Son who has come to us to illuminate our minds to your truth. We praise you and honor you in his name. Amen. Be seated, please. A couple of important things about this section of John's Gospel that I want you to understand. Immediately prior to, the, to this verse, verses 1 through 11 in chapter 8, is the story about the woman who was caught in adultery, and the Pharisees brought her to Jesus to see what Jesus would do with her. And if you recall, Jesus said to them, He that is without sin amongst you should cast the first stone. And they all went away ashamed and embarrassed because they knew that they were just as guilty. And he turned to the woman and said, where, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And she said, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We love that story. It's a powerful example of the grace and the mercy and the hope of God. And it speaks to our hearts because we know that we are all guilty in some way, shape, or form. What's important for us to understand about that particular story is it's probably not in chronological order with the rest of John's gospel. Um, we think, the scholars and the so-called experts think, that that story was inserted into John's gospel at a later date. There's no question about the authenticity of the story or the fact that it actually happened. No one disputes the facts. No one disputes that the apostle John recorded and wrote that story down. It just... We don't think it happened right here because there's many, many other things in the context and it just kind of doesn't fit. What's happening in the context and the setting of Jesus' statement, and you've got to go back into chapter 7 to find these things, Jesus is in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles, the Festival of Booths, as it is also called. It's an annual event where all the people of Israel would go camping for a week. And they would build, out of branches and sticks, booths, tabernacles. And they camp out in order to be reminded of the 40 years of desert wilderness wanderings that the children of Israel went through. So it was an annual festival to remind them that God cared for them, God provided for them. God blessed them with his presence all the way through the desert. They'd have a big fire, a big smoky 
fire so that it would kind of represent the pillar of cloud rising up into the sky, the presence of God. Part of the festival of tabernacles was a ceremony with pouring out of water to remind them that uh, Moses poured water out of the rock. Um, part of this festival was four giant candelabras, menorahs. Uh, like 60 feet tall, giant, big, big, big. And each one of them had four vats of oil, each one, each vat holding a flame. They were fed by 10-gallon uh, barrels of oil, huge flame. Think like Olympic Stadium flame kind of thing, and it would illuminate the entire temple, and it would illuminate all the all of Jerusalem that surrounded the temple. This was a big, big, big deal. And it represented, of course, the, the fire, the, the pillar of fire by night, the presence of God that guided them through. So in the middle of this great feast, in the middle of this festival, all the ways they are celebrating God's protection, God's blessing, God's provision, God's care on them, Jesus is there with them. And he's saying, talking to the face, said, if you really knew your father, you'd know who I am. If you'd really understand the story of God's blessing and provision and protection, you would recognize your Savior and your Messiah that is amongst you. And of course, the religious people said, oh no, not you. Can't be you, Jesus. You blasphemer. You got a demon off with you. Go away. We don't like you anymore. John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast, at the point where they were doing the ceremonial pouring out of the water to celebrate God's provision and God's care for his people, the way God provides for his people, Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, just as light represents truth and goodness and grace in the presence of God, water in Scripture very often represents the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, the indwelling, the guidance, the conviction of God, that Spirit of God that is with us all the time and continually. Jesus is saying these words, the Son of God, right in the midst of, as they celebrate God's protection... As they celebrate God's provision, their provision and protection is right there talking to them. And they did not recognize him. Didn't want anything to do with him. So the very next day, at the close of the feast, as the giant menorahs were being extinguished, Jesus said in, in chapter 8, verse 12, see the menorah, you see the light that you celebrate, and then he said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of light. Now, given the context, given the setting, given all those facts that I shared with you, it is apparent, it is obvious that Jesus is making an incredibly bold statement, an incredibly powerful statement about his identity. He is clearly saying to all those who are gathered, he said, I am the one. I am your redeemer. I am your savior. I am your Messiah. The I am portion of this statement, as with all the other I am's in John's gospel, it's a reflection back to God's personal name, Yahweh, I am who I am, given to Moses, Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush. I am. He says, I am the light. I am the illumination, the presence of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, the holiness of God, the purity of God. Here in your presence. Not merely that I am a light, but I am the light. Not one among many, not even one above many. The source, singular, exclusive. I am the light. He says, I am the light of the world. To all the world, to all the people, everywhere. 
Not just the Jews, not just the people of Israel, but to the Gentiles as well, to the pagans, to the heretics, to the outcasts, to the clean and the unclean, the sinners and the righteous. He is the light to all the world. People listen to me now. When I say that Jesus is the light of the world, it means that he is God on the earth in order to provide the blessing, the protection, the provision for God's people. And that includes you. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done. Jesus is the light. Jesus is your answer. What was the question? It's all found in him. He is the light of the world. In the earlier service, I had him dim the light so that it was just enough for me to be able to see my notes. But it wasn't really dark. And as I was thinking about how can I illustrate this sermon, I was trying to think of a way to make it really, really dark in here. And I thought about, that's a lot of stained glass to cover up. <laughs> I thought that might be an illustration a little bit more than what I'm prepared. To. Why do we need light for? What does light do for us? Light does so many things for us and we take it so much for granted. Light illuminates. Light enables us to see clearly. When it's dark, all the same things are there and they're all in, this, in the right places. We just don't always see them, do we? It's middle of the night and you get out of bed and you go to the kitchen to get that drink of water, but it's dark in the middle of the night so you don't turn the lights on. And how many times do you crack your toe into that table? crash your knee into the sofa. You knew that table was there. You put it there. It's your house. And yet, crash, crash. The light exposes the things around us. Well, likewise, the light of Christ exposes the things inside of us. All the difficult parts of our soul, all those parts of our character that we'd rather folks not be known about, the stuff we want to put away and conceal and hide, the stuff we even want to pretend we don't have. You know you got that. It's Sunday and we're all wearing our fancy churchy clothes with our smile on our faces. Come on now, we know better. We're, just, we're all just regular folks. We got that dark side inside of us. The light of Christ exposes that. Ephesians 5 talked about that the unfruitful and the shameful and the secret things, the works of darkness that is in all of us, the light of Christ makes that manifest. It exposes that. It reveals that to us. It shows it to ourselves so that we can see that in myself and say, you know what? That does not honor God. That doesn't help my relationships or benefit my life. I need to resolve that matter in me. We can clearly see who we are in God's sight because he is the light of the world. And it illuminates the darkness that's found in our heart. The light of Christ illuminates our minds as well. It illuminates our thinking. We can see clearly and we can think more clearly because our minds get illuminated to the things of God. Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know that which we have been freely given from God. The, nat the natural man, the unsaved, the lost soul, does not receive the things of God because they are foolishness. All that truth of God is spiritually discerned. And we can discern that and apprehend that because the Spirit illuminates that in us and it shines the light on it so we can get it, so we can see it and understand it more clearly, more powerfully, and have a better perspective on the world. The natural, sin-filled mind doesn't understand any of these things. But when we see the light of Christ, ah, then we begin to see everything else as well. C.S. Lewis, the great theologian and author, said, I believe in Christ like I believe in the Son, not only because I see it, but because by it all things are seen. 
That's powerful there. Third, light gives life. Light gives life. If the sun went out, we'd be gone in about two seconds. There, we could not sustain life on earth. We know that. It's, think about how powerful daylight savings is. I know you hate it. I know it's goofy and stupid. It messes you up for like a week. Just that because the rhythms of life are based on how we receive light. In the wintertime, as the days are short and the weather is gloomy, many, many people suffer from a real thing called seasonal affective disorder, otherwise known as the winter doldrums. And it's walking around and you got no energy and the, it hasn't shined, the sun hasn't shown in 10 days and the days are short, it's 4 o'clock and the sun goes down, it's misery. But now, hey... Days are getting longer. It's going to be 66 degrees today. It's feeling like springtime. We feel like our life has come back and there's an energy and a vitality about our lives just because of light. The light of Jesus Christ does the same thing in us. How many people you know are walking around in misery in their natural self because they're burdened by the woes of the world and all the troubles and they got no confidence and they got no hope and they're in depression because they don't know how much they are loved and cherished by the God who created them. In Christ my sins are forgiven, I'm set free. In Christ I have a home and a hope and a future. In Christ I am the accepted and the beloved and the righteousness of God in Him. And there's a new life and there's a new vitality and it's exciting and it's wonderful and it's abundant because He is the light of the world. My life is better because of Him. John chapter 1. Verse 4 and 5, in him was the light. and That light is the life of men. Plants get their energy from the sun, photosynthesis and all that. We're the same way to the sun. S-O-N. Fourth, the light scatters and overcomes the darkness. The darkness has to flee. The light forces the darkness out and away. The darkness cannot overcome the truth of the light. And when the light comes, the darkness has to go. It does not have a choice. John 1, 5 in our New King James, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now in our English-speaking minds, we think of that and we think of the word comprehend, meaning understand and apprehend and those kind of things. We generally take that to mean the darkness does not understand the light. The darkness doesn't get it. The darkness doesn't accept it. The idea being that the darkness wants to reject the light. Okay. But the word here for comprehend in the original language is a little bit different, a little more complex than that. It can also mean... Not only comprehend, but apprehend. To overcome. To take hold of. The darkness did not overtake the light. The darkness did not catch up to the light. The darkness does not defeat the light. And that's really the better understanding of this particular verse. The light wins because the darkness cannot stand it anymore. Light. Light guides us. Light illuminates our way, marks our path. It's dark outside, and you've got to go out to the barn and check on the cows, or whatever it is you do. <laughs> what do you do? You get a flashlight, so you can get there and get back. The ships at sea, how do they navigate? Because of that lighthouse way far away that they can see shining in the night, and they know exactly where they are because the map tells them where the light is, and they know where they are. It guides our way. Jesus, the light of the world, guides our lives and marks our path through his word that speaks to us. His word is a light unto my path. A lamp to my feet. 
And I can see, I can see, I can find my way more clearly because Jesus is the light of the world. No doubt from way back when, well, those of us beyond a certain age anyway, remember a country singer called Hank Williams, right? And he sang that song, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. For those who are a little bit younger than that, you might remember a music group called DC Talk. Toby Mac, those guys, they took a little bit of R&B and some gospel and a little bit of rap music and they tied that all in together and they had a whole new sound that appealed to a whole new audience and they had a song called In the Light and the lyrics said I want to be in the light as you are in the light I want to shine like the stars in the heavens Lord be my light and be my salvation because all I want to be is in the light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And he illuminates us, and he illuminates our hearts and minds and our lives, and through his word he guides us. And because of his light, we have a chance to be part of that light and to be in the light, in faith and by faith, and put our hope and trust and confidence in Jesus alone. We can see the light. And we can be in the light. And oddly enough, and the most remarkable part of all is we become part of that light. And that light is given to us. And it is transferred, imputed, if you want to get all theological about it. Because we become part of the light too. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then later on in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you are the light of the world. And in Christ and because of Christ, we, we have that. And we possess that. And we have the opportunity to go forth in courage and boldness and share that light and be a part of the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. We don't hide the light. city on a hill cannot be hidden. You don't take a lamp and put it under a basket. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. Illuminate the world. Illuminate the truth of God to the world around us. That light and love of Christ comes to us and transforms us and illuminates us and casts out all the darkness and then we shine and live as a witness for him. And that, my friends, is how the kingdom of God is going to go forth in the world today. Amen? Be the light. Let your light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And may it be so for all of us today. Father God, we give you thanks and praise for all that you are. And we pray, God, that we would really, truly, and obviously and honestly be part of your light and your world and your kingdom. That we would be transformed. That we would live a life that is exposed before you and mankind that we would have honesty and integrity about all those things, and that your light would prevail in us and all around us. We thank you. We praise you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We're going to close our time together with a hymn of invitation. The altar will be open for prayer. Whatever prayers are on your heart and mind today, I invite you to know the light, to see the light, to receive that light, be born again by the light of Christ let that well up in you. It'll change your life forever. If you need to know Jesus, if you've got other prayers on your heart today, I'd love to talk with you during this time. We're going to stand together and sing this song. If you have a burden, you come meet me down front. God will be glorified. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.